Good morning, Dreamforce. Welcome to day four. If you're looking for your Apex code and the Salesforce security model, you're in the right place. You're probably familiar with this. It's the Salesforce Safe Harbor Statement. It advises you to only make purchase decisions based upon currently shipping product. You can read this at your leisure on the Salesforce website. My name is Matt Qualiana. I am a principal solution consultant at a company called Velocity. We are a strategic Salesforce partner. We build industry-specific applications on top of the Salesforce cloud. I focus exclusively on our solutions for government customers. Before I was at Velocity, I worked at Salesforce in a similar role, helping government agencies adopt the cloud to provide better service to citizens. For the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about your Apex code and the Salesforce security model. And here's what we're going to cover. We're going to begin with a quick review of how Salesforce security works, all the various options you have for configuring security in your org. Then I'm going to discuss how all that relates to your Apex code and then share with you some best practices on how to make sure your code is secure. So by the end of the 19 minutes, uh, from now, you should walk out of here with uh, perhaps some new information about how Salesforce security works and some ideas that you can take home to use to make your code even more secure. So let's start with a quick review of Salesforce security. Most of this should be already familiar to anyone who's been using Salesforce for any period of time. I like to review it, though, just to make sure we're all on the same page. There might be one or two pieces of this that you've forgotten about. When people think about Salesforce security, the first thing that comes to mind typically are profiles. Profiles are really important. Every user has a profile, and that profile determines that user's CRUD access to objects. And CRUD is an acronym you'll see throughout the Salesforce documentation. It stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. So for each object, you can define whether a profile has the ability to perform each of those operations on that object. And realize we're talking about object types, not individual records. We'll get to that in a few moments. Profiles also <coughs> cover not just access to objects, but to the fields on those objects, what's often referred to as field level security. And you'll see this abbreviated commonly as FLS. So in a profile for a particular object, we can determine whether that profile has the ability to read or read write that particular field. Now, in addition to profiles, Salesforce also offers something called permission sets. Permission sets are a way for you to extend a profile. So you might have a profile that applies to most of your users, but there's a class of users that need some additional permissions. You don't want to create a second profile, because you're going to start to get a lot of profiles if you do that. So instead, you might create a permission set. Now, permission sets are really useful, but the thing to remember about them is that they only let you expand access. So I might have a user who has a profile, and then I apply a permission set to that user to give them additional access beyond what the profile would give them. Now, another important setting in your Salesforce org are the org-wide defaults, commonly referred to as OWD. Org-wide defaults determine access for records where you are not the owner or where the user is not the owner. So for each object type, you can specify whether that object is public read-write or public read-only or private, and there's lots of different settings here. But this works on an org-wide basis per the name. And again, these are rules to determine how people access objects where they are not the owner. Now, speaking of ownership, another important topic when we talk about security is <coughs> the roles and the role hierarchies that are set up in your org. So each record will have an owner, and each user can have a role. And when you create roles, you typically organize, well, you do organize those into hierarchies. And the role hierarchy determines how users access individual records. And what this means is if you have a record that has been set to private so that only the owner can access it, and I own a record, but I'm in a role hierarchy, then my manager and his manager and her manager and everyone above me in the organization can also access that record because the role hierarchy essentially extends ownership. It's as though everyone above me in the hierarchy also has ownership of everything I have. And this works very well if you're organizing things into territories for a sales org, or you might organize it around uh, products. You can organize your role hierarchies however you'd like. One other somewhat <coughs> sometimes forgotten but really important uh, security feature is you can set up sharing rules. So sharing rules lets you support special access requirements. In this example, I've got a rule called Texas sharing. I'm from Austin, Texas, by the way. Any, any Texans out there? There we go. I like it. So uh, I like how quick the hand went up, too. Yes. 
Uh, this rule is called Texas sharing. And what this rule is doing is it is enabling uh, any user who's in a group called Texas users to have access to any contact where the state in the address field is Texas. So regardless of ownership, actually, I think this is for accounts. Regardless of ownership of that account, uh, anyone who's in Texas, in the Texas users group, would be able to have access to this, uh, to this account. So sharing rules let you shape access. And sharing rules are kind of like permission sets in that they are always additive. They always let you expand access. Speaking of contacts, one last important point about contacts, and I forget this sometimes, is that contacts inherit their access from accounts. So a contact itself doesn't have much in the way of security settings. It's always getting its security settings from the account that it's associated with. And if you have a contact that doesn't have an account, which you can do, then that contact is inherently private. Only the owner has access to that account. In my job, I spend a lot of time building demo orgs, and I'll create a bunch of contacts. And then later, I'll go into a community and like, where are all my contacts, and why can't I see them? And that's because I've forgotten to associate those contacts to an account. But I'll usually spend about five minutes scratching my head trying to figure out where my contacts went. So that's an important thing to remember. So a quick summary of what we just covered, because that's kind of the, the landscape of security controls for Salesforce. And hopefully, all of this was, uh, was familiar territory for you, is that every user has a profile. And every user must have a profile, and users can only have one profile. Now, every user can have a single role, but roles are optional. In an org of any size, though, you're probably going to want to use roles, because roles are a really useful tool for organizing access to records. Now, each user can have any number of permission sets from 0 to whatever number you want to assign to them. And the same goes for sharing rules. So sharing rules and permission sets are optional. And you can assign more than one if you'd like to. So the combination of profile plus permission sets, the roles and the role hierarchies, the org-wide defaults, and sharing rules, all these things combine to shape each individual user's access to data. So you have a lot of levers to play with and to adjust to make sure that your, data, your users have access to the data they should and don't have access to the data they don't. And all of your declarative configuration runs inside the user context. So it runs within the bounds of all of these settings and rules. So everything that you configure and what I've discussed so far, all of your declarative configuration always respects all of that always. And that's kind of the great thing about Salesforce is once I set up this security, it just works the way I expect it to. So now let's talk about your Apex code. Your Apex code has a little bit of a variation here. There's a, little, a few special points. Probably the most important point is this. Apex code runs in the system context, not the user context. So if you don't remember anything else from this session, or if you get up and leave in 30 seconds, because I'd make a really bad joke, I might, <clears throat> remember this, that your Apex code runs in the system context, not the user context. And that's an important distinction. Now, in most cases, in spite of the fact that your Apex code runs in the system context, in most cases, Apex enforces security the way you'd expect it to, and your Apex code behaves just like declarative configuration in most cases. However, in some situations, Apex lets you decide how to handle security. And that's what we're going to spend the next uh, 10 minutes covering. So let's first talk about controllers, because controllers are typically how you get access to data, right? So standard controllers always do what you expect them to. They enforce security, uh, in this example, field level security. And custom controllers do the same via direct reference. So kind of the, the typical way you're used to using controllers is a direct reference. And custom controllers handle security as expected with a direct reference. Lightning components don't automatically enforce CRUD and FLS when you reference objects or retrieve objects from an Apex controller. So for Lightning components that are retrieving data via an Apex controller, you'll have to use the techniques that I'm about to show you next to make sure you enforce security. Likewise, when you're using an indirect reference in a controller, your Apex code does not enforce field level security. So this is a really important point, because you can write Apex that completely ignores field level security, and now you're at risk of leaking data. So you might be saying to yourself what I said when I first read this, what the heck is an indirect reference? What, what, what does that mean? Where am I at risk? So let me show you an example. So here's some code that is a controller extension on the contact object. And here in line uh, 10, I am doing a SQL query and assigning the results to a local contact 
uh, in my code called color contact. We're trying to get access to a custom field on the contact called favorite color. And let's just say for the sake of uh, this example that favorite color is a secret piece of information and not everyone should have access to it. And some profiles have access to it and some profiles do not have access to it. In line 11, we make an indirect reference. So that's an indirect reference. Line 11, we're assigning the favorite color into a string. So that's the point where we could be leaking data. Because <clears throat> that line right there maybe uh, is insecure. There's nothing in my code that's ensuring that we're protecting the favorite color field so that we're not giving access to colors to people who shouldn't have it. A little bit of a contrived example, because colors aren't really that, they're not PII typically, but this is the example. The good news is that there is an easy way to fix this. And that easy way <laughs> looks like this. We're going to add a single test. Uh, line 10, I've added a if statement. And we're uh, calling a method there called isAccessible. It's part of the schema object. So I can essentially test for any individual field or object, actually, uh, all of the CRUD operations. And this one is, is a read operation. Uh, at the end of this, I have a slide that covers all of the various methods. But I can wrap my code in these tests where necessary when I'm making an indirect reference. And therefore, I can handle field level security gracefully. Now, you might wonder why Salesforce does this. I've actually wondered, why doesn't it just do it for me? And I've realized that this is actually smart. Because you should only be writing code to handle requirements that configuration can't handle, right? So I haven't run across it in the wild yet, but I can easily think up requirements that Salesforce security configuration can't handle. So here's a good example. Uh, I want a user to have access to a field only during business hours. They can log into the system, they can do things, but there are, there's some business requirement why during certain hours of the day or dirt, certain days of the week or other arbitrary conditions, the user can have access, and under under conditions, they can't have access. Or maybe they can have access to the field if another field has a certain value. Whatever that test is, this is how you'd support it. Your code could check to see whether you're within the, the operating hours that you want it to support or the other conditions that you want to define, and then provide access or deny access. So it actually is smart that Salesforce lets you do this. But this is how you do it. There's another tip about your code that is a really important one. This is the second thing you should remember from the session, the first one being that your code runs in the system context. The second one is this uh, set of keywords with sharing. So if you add with sharing to your, uh, to your code, it will make your code respect org-wide defaults the role hierarchy, and sharing rules. If you don't have with sharing in your code, then none of those things apply to your code. Because remember, your code runs in the system context. So when you go home, I would just go through all of your code. Well, I wouldn't do it. You should go through all of your code and check to see if you have with sharing in your classes, and then add it and test and you know, roll that out. Because this, uh, this is definitely a best practice that Salesforce uh, strongly recommends for, for everything that you write. All right, so speaking of best practices, let's talk about a few. The first one is to use declarative configuration whenever possible. How do you write secure code? The easiest way to do it is don't write it. And I know that sounds a little flip, but I'm actually quite serious. I took an Apex programming class uh, not long after I joined Salesforce, and the instructor was really smart. Every third or fourth exercise he'd give us, he, he would give us something to go implement in our training org that didn't require code, because he wanted to kind of force us every time we saw a problem, to not immediately think, oh, I need to write code for this. You know, the old saying, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I encourage people to not write code. There will be times when you have to, and then you should apply everything else that you see here. But the, the, the most important thing you can do is find a solution that requires uh, just point and click. So when you are writing code, when possible, use standard controllers. They'll just do what, it, what you expect them to do. Uh, use direct references, which are the traditional or the common way of using controllers that you're um, probably most familiar with. Here's one that is a little bit tangential to the topic, but important to throw out there as a kind of a grab bag item. Uh, in your visual force, use the input field whenever possible, because the input field understands the user's field level security rules, whereas input text, which is not bound to a field, doesn't. So that kind of handles uh, field level security for you. It's a good, good tip to have in there. And again, I'll, this is worth mentioning twice, 
use with sharing to enforce OWD role hierarchy and sharing rules. I'm going to get out of the way so anyone taking pictures has a clean view of this one and the next one. So a few more best practices. This is why I stepped out of the way. Uh, in your code, you can add security checks as needed. And this is the set of functions that I was referencing. My example used is accessible to see if we had read access to a field. You also have methods called is creatable, is updatable, and is deletable. Be sure to check all of your web services implementations in addition to your, uh, your other code. And this is one that <clears throat> I don't, I work in sales, so I don't often have to take things live, but it's an important point that I like to remember to remind people, which is to test using real life profiles. And before you go live, test to make sure that your security is set up the way you expect it to and test all your code against real profiles. It's easy for a developer to test against their own profile or a sysadmin profile, but then you're not going to get a, a good, uh, you know, good test result. So there's a really good article from Salesforce that I'm referencing here about uh, testing CRUD and field level enforcement. <clears throat> and this page says two things. It says that as a developer, Salesforce expects you to always enforce CRUD, create, read, update, and delete permissions, and field level security on all standard objects and fields. Like that's, your ex that's their expectation of you as a developer. And then you're also expected to always enforce those same things on your own objects, unless you have a good reason not to. So the examples that I gave earlier are some good reasons why you might uh, not enforce field level security, or you might change your enforcement of field level security. Uh, but these are your, the expectations, uh, the guidance from Salesforce. So in conclusion, a couple of points for you. I always like to repeat this because this is kind of an important point. There's a whole set of levers and dials that uh, determine security, and that's profiles, permission sets, the roles and their hierarchy, the org-wide defaults, the sharing rules. These all combine to let you shape each user's access to data. Your configuration always runs in the system context. Apex always run. I'm sorry. Your configuration always runs in the user context. I need another cup of coffee. Going to go there next. <clears throat> Your apex always runs in the system context. For most of your code, security will just work as you expect. But in a few situations, the ones that I've covered, apex lets you decide how to handle security. So you need to know that that's your responsibility and then go implement it the way that you'd like to. So if you'd like to learn more about these topics, there's a couple of trailheads that are very helpful. And I've kind of put them out here from beginning to intermediate to advanced. Uh, security basics is, as you'd expect, the uh, entry level trailhead on this. Data security is another good module. And then the last module there, data leak prevention, goes into detail on the exact sort of things that I was showing in my uh, sample codes. So if you want to get more hands on and try this out yourself, you could uh, check out that trailhead module. I know that there are a ton of various sessions going on right now. So I appreciate everyone making some time for this one. I will stick around for a few minutes afterwards if anyone have any questions. But I just want to say thank you for, thank you for coming. Go back one slide.